Well, we've made our way to the third chapter of Luke's Gospel, and it is here that we may say, in one sense, the Gospel really launches. Luke's composition to this point has been largely preparatory as he has provided for us the very valuable birth narratives of both John the Baptist and our Lord Jesus Christ. And now one gets the sense that the gospel story itself really begins. And it begins surprisingly, perhaps, with the ministry of John the Baptist. Uh, later, Luke will provide us with a little vignette in his 10th chapter of the book of Acts. And I'm gonna ask you to turn in your Bibles uh, to that 10th chapter of Acts. Uh, but he's going to give us a, a, this little vignette of the now Apostle Peter standing before an audience of exclusively uh, God-fearing Gentiles. And the centurion uh, Cornelius had assembled them to hear all that God had given Peter to speak to them regarding the work he was accomplishing among them. This company uh, was largely a blank slate as far as their knowledge of what had recently transpired in the life and work of Jesus and the salvation he had accomplished through the, his death on the cross. They had heard of it, but they had a little idea of its import. But now, however, God had sent Peter to proclaim it to the Gentiles, and we pick up the account here in Acts 10 in the 36th verse, Peter speaking, the word which he sent to the sons of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know the thing which took place throughout all Judea, starting from Galilee. After the baptism which John proclaimed, you know of Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses of all the things he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They also put him to death by hanging him on a cross. God raised him up on the third day and granted that he become Visible, And then Peter continues for a brief spell until the Holy Spirit interrupts him and falls upon all these eager Gentiles hearing the gospel for the first time. But what I want you to notice is the little clause in verse 37, you know the thing which took place after the baptism which John proclaimed. Peter understood that the gospel events God had brought about in their time began with the service John the Baptist rendered beforehand. And so in proclaiming it to the Gentiles, he starts with that. Luke has already identified his important role in the first chapter. The angel Gabriel had appeared to Zacharias and promised him a miracle son who would be great in the sight of the Lord and would turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. And it would be he who would go as a forerunner before Messiah in the spirit and power of Elijah to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. John was the last of God's great prophets. Throughout the history of the chosen people of God, beginning with Abraham and then preeminently in Moses, but then by the mouth of the great prophets who succeeded them, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the rest, one after another, God sent them to bring God's message to his people. It had been 400 years since God had sent a prophet. And now John was the last in a momentous event. John revived the function of the prophet. Before Messiah would come, John had to come first uh, to serve as God's instrument in preparing the hearts of the people for the reception of their Messiah, then introduce him to the world and eventually uh, baptize him. 
He was the most direct link between the prophetic tradition and Messiah's coming. So we see Luke begins his third chapter, not with the date uh, Jesus started his public ministry, but with the date of John's. John preached the gospel to the people of his time by announcing to them the moment had arrived for Messiah's appearance and by preparing them for his coming. So we're going to read beginning in verse 1 of chapter 3. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip was tetrarch of the region of Iturea and Trachonitis, and Lysanias was tetrarch of Abilene, in the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he came into all the district around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every ravine will be filled and every mountain and hill will be brought low. The crooked will become straight and the rough roads smooth and all flesh will see the salvation of God. So he began saying to the crowds who were going out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits in keeping with repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that from these stones, God is able to raise up children to Abraham. Indeed, the ax is already laid at the root of the tree, so every tree that does not bear fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds were questioning him, saying, Then what shall we do? And he would answer and say to them, The man who has two tunics is to share with him who has none, and he who has food, food is to do likewise. And some tax collectors also came to be baptized. And they said to him, Teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, Collect no more than what you have been ordered to. Some soldiers were questioning him, saying, And what about us? What shall we do? And he said to them, Do not take money from anyone by force or accuse anyone falsely and be content with your wages. Well, Luke... Uh, we'll go on to quickly divert our attention uh, to the Lord Jesus Christ, the one he had been, that John had been commissioned to proclaim. But he is an historian, we remember. So first, the historian in Luke uh, sets the date, uh, not the date uh, marking the beginning of Jesus's ministry, but the date John's ministry began. And we're familiar with these names, not so much likely because we're great historians, uh, but we're, uh, we, we read our Bible, and these names are, uh, occur in the New Testament. It was the 15th year, for example, of the reign of Tiberius uh, Caesar. Uh, that ought to be clear enough, the 15th year. Unfortunately, it's not. Uh, I'll simplify the difficulty for our purposes. The Roman Senate, when they conferred upon Augustus the title Caesar or Emperor, did so with the caveat that he would not establish an ongoing dynastic rule over Rome, rather his reign would end at his death. Augustus circumvented that, however, by appointing his son-in-law, Tiberius, to be his co-regent while Augustus was yet living. And the academics who differ and attempt to identify the exact chronology of these times uh, tried to decide whether Luke was reckoning 
with uh, this, this 15th year of Tiberius' reign from the date that he became co-regent or from the date that Augustus died. And nearly all the modern uh, scholars have opted for the latter. And so that would place these events somewhere during the period AD 28 or 29. That's interesting to me. I don't know if it is to you. And then Luke mentions the various political regions into which the lands of the Jews had been subdivided under the Roman rule and who ruled over each. Pontius Pilate, we know his jurisdiction was over Judea proper, the area around uh, Jerusalem. The Herod that he cites is Herod Antipas, uh, the son of Herod the Great. He is the Herod that we read about uh, more than others in the New Testament. He had a brother named Philip who had been assigned to rule over the area east of Galilee on the east side of the Jordan River and whose own name, Philip's, is associated with Caesarea Philippi. Lysanias' name is not very well known, uh, not entirely, but he ruled the region Abilene, north of Iteria. If you, you know, I always go to a map, and you probably do too when you really are curious about this, but you can see these regions. And of course, we're familiar with Annas and, and Caiaphas. Uh, Caiaphas was Annas's son-in-law and the high priest who nominally, anyway, acted in that capacity when Jesus was tried and killed, though history records that Annas continued uh, to bear influence on the priesthood. Well, the names are all important historically, uh, but serve the purpose also of conjuring the dark mood of the period in which nefarious nepotism reigned in the empire and spiritual wickedness pervaded the Jewish leadership. And it was into this dark period of history that God introduced his prophet. And Luke does justice to it by borrowing the familiar formula of the prophets of old, such as Jeremiah and Hosea, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias. This identifies him for us fully. He is God's prophet, and he is the one whom God has prom had promised to the righteous priest, Zacharias, at the beginning of our gospel account. And notably, John hailed from the wilderness. That's where he had gone when Luke last mentioned him. I think it's verse 80 of chapter 1. Uh, the wilderness, perhaps, uh, brought... Uh, mental associations to the Jews unique to them, for it was in the wilderness that God had first formed them as a people. And according to Isaiah chapter 40, the place from which their ultimate comfort was to come. And this wilderness theme runs throughout uh, much of the prophecies of the Old Testament. There is this recurrent chain of thought that uh, just as in the exodus from Egypt, when God delivered his people by bringing them out of captivity and taking them into and through the wilderness, where he then met with them and tabernacled among them with a view to leading them to their promised rest, one day he would do it again. It would be in the wilderness where the people would again have to go to meet their God. So verse 3, verse 3 uh, gives to us uh, John's ministry in, in capsule form. He was a baptizer, so he came into a region where there was plenty of water, the, the Jordan Valley, and there, writes Luke, he was preaching a repentance, a baptism, a, 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 a preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. What does that mean? Well, what that means is John was baptizing people who had repented. Uh, the baptism itself was an outward sign of the desire they had expressed to repent of their sins. 
And the motivation for that is the same we are all so familiar with. We wish our sins to be forgiven. Uh, John was preaching that the people of Israel should repent of their sins for the salvation promised from long ago was at their doorstep. Repent, he was saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's from Matthew chapter 3. Now, baptism itself uh, was not a new thing. We're familiar with baptism. We practice it here. So take ourselves back to this time. Baptism was not a new thing. The Jews uh, utilized ritual uh, washings of baptisms as symbols of the washing away of our uh, sins. There's good evidence that at this time they were using baptism on proselytes, a, a kind of a, a ceremony to cleanse converts from the defilement that they saw as characteristic of, of Gentiles. What had to have been unsettling now about John's practice was that he was insisting that such a sign was required even of the children of Israel. They too needed to be cleanse. And so John called them to repent. Well, to repent, you know, is, is to be more than sorry for your sin. It's to have a change of mind about the direction of your life and of your devotions and to turn and go the other way. It is more than an emotion, though it can be an emotional experience. It's an act of the will, an act of the mind, and therefore of uh, the spirit. Uh, John was calling the people to return to a right relationship with the Lord. And faith is intimately related to repentance. There can be no repentance without faith, nor can there be true believing faith, as we see it in the Bible, without repentance. They are the familiar two sides of the same coin. If repentance is the turning away from our sin and our rebellion, faith represents what we're turning to. We're turning away from something and to another thing. Let me give you an illustration of this. And it comes from Luke's own pen in Acts, that chapter 10 of Acts, but in verse 43, uh, Peter is addressing, addressing those gathering, those, those Gentiles who were gathered in Cornelius' house. And the last thing he says to them before the Holy Spirit falls upon them is that through the name of Jesus Christ, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. Everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. So fair enough. But in the next chapter, when Peter uh, reports to the church in Jerusalem exactly what happened that day, in verse 18 of Acts chapter 11, the Jerusalemites conclude, well then, God has granted to the Gentiles also what? the gift of faith, uh, the insight to believe, the trust in Christ that saves. No, they marvel. God has granted to the Gentiles also the repentance that leads to life. So in chapter 10, those who believe receive forgiveness. In chapter 11, uh, they who are said to have repented receive life. Uh, the terms seem to have been used almost synonymously. They're not exactly, but uh, they are so closely related to one another that they can be used uh, interchangeably. So when we read here in this third verse that John was preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, what we're to understand is that after 30 years of preparation in the wilderness, he strode into the lives of this historic people who had lost their connection to the faith of their fathers. 
clothed in a robe of camel's hair with a, a leather thong. He personified a, a prophet of God, and he was so full of the Spirit of God that as he preached to them and called them to repent of their sins in faith, they fell under the conviction of their sins, repented of them, and then asked for John's baptism as a sign of what they had done. Well, we should note uh, that neither repentance nor faith was anything other than the gracious gift of God. There's never a note of tit for tat suggesting that if we will only repent and believe that will somehow merit anything from God, much less his salvation. No, even their repentance and faith were the free gifts of God. And that's evident from the expression. I know many of you noticed the expression they used there in Acts chapter 11, God has granted to them to the Gentiles the repentance that leads to life. He had gifted them uh, with that repentance. Even so, the, the ministry of John the Baptist was fueled by the movement of the Spirit of God, bringing regeneration to the crowds who amassed in the wilderness to hear John preach. As the Apostle Paul would later observe, it was by grace they were being saved and not by works of merit. Nevertheless, it is through repentance and faith that God conveys the new life of his spirit. That's what we learn here, uh, that they are the indelible marks of the true Christian. There's no such thing as an unrepentant believer. Saved souls are repentant souls. But here, unlike Paul, who I've been quoting, uh, who ministered after Christ had come and, and accomplished his saving mission, John's mission was preparatory to his coming. And Luke indicates that now, beginning in verse 4, by seeing in his ministry the fulfillment of the ancient prophecy of Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 40. His preaching was the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. Every ravine will be filled, and every mountain and hill will be brought low. The crooked will become straight, and the rough roads smooth, and all flesh will see the salvation of God. Wonderful passage. We're all so familiar with it in song and in reading. Uh, all four gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, saw in John the Baptist the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. But only Luke included the last two verses of it, including his remark that all flesh would see God's salvation. And that's in keeping uh, with Luke's uh, running theme in his gospel of the universality of the offer of salvation. John was calling the people to prepare their hearts for the coming of the Messiah. And the figure Luke uses, borrowing from the Isaiah passage, is this ancient Eastern practice of anticipating the arrival of an important foreign uh, potentate uh, who, anticipating his arrival by constructing a new uh, level and smooth highway into their city. They actually did that, and there's many examples from history. Interpreted, though, let's interpret it, the message was that people should already be straightening out the crookedness of their own hearts and doing whatever was necessary to smooth out uh, the rough places. We've all done that, haven't we? Recognized by God's grace, we have a few rough spots in our life, in our conduct, in our relationships. So smooth those out, he was saying, in order to present to the coming king the attitude and conduct becoming to a citizen 
of his kingdom. The king John was alluding to was the king of kings. John was going before him to prepare the way. The gospel accounts uh, lead us to believe that great crowds were coming out to see John in the wilderness. Uh, Matthew and Mark both report that all the country of Judea was going out to him and all the people of Jerusalem. And they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. But not all of them had pure motives. And John discerned the truth about those. Uh, some, no doubt, went out for the curiosity of it all, for John was the distinct figure of his day, considered by not a few as a, a mystical eccentric. He was the talk of the town. Uh, who would want to miss out on the show? So you had these coming out to see. Others were religious leaders who uh, weren't to be taken in by what they considered to be his theatrics. And others uh, likely were his enemies, and John knew it. They were the religious leaders of the Jews. Uh, Luke doesn't delineate for us the makeup of the crowds who swarmed out. Uh, he just refers to them generally, but Matthew does. In Matthew chapter 3, uh, verse 7, uh, we read there that John looked up and he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees uh, coming out for baptism. And, that, and that, that was when John shouted out, as here in verse 7, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Not a very welcoming thing to say to the high and mighty. John chose his language uh, carefully, though. Uh, he would have been especially, he'd been in the wilderness living for 30 years. He would have been especially familiar with the ways of, of desert snakes that would come slithering across the desert floor and out of the typical brush fires that would erupt now and again. That was the image that came to John's mind as he looked out and saw those uh, hypocritical Jewish ecclesiasts making their way out to hedge their bets concerning the judgment to come. You know, we ourselves have quite adequate colloquialisms to describe how they were covering their backsides by going out to John with all the hoi polloi who typically they wouldn't congregate with. But this was no desert fire John warned against. This was the wrath of God, his judgment against sinners and pretenders that was sure to come. That's what John was talking about. His rebuke was there for their apparent belief instilled in them, obviously, by those who had reported back to them, that simply by going out uh, to be baptized by John, they could avert that judgment. John wanted to baptize people, but only if they had truly repented. And that was not the case, he knew, with these. That was apparent by their behavior. They, they had not repented, and the proof of that was in the lack of fruit in their lives. And so you follow his, 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 his speaking here, the fruit of repentance, the fruit of it was not apparent in their lives. Instead, they fell back on the delusion that has crippled sinners for all time that how in some way their association with religion or with religious people will gain them God's approval. The Pharisees and the Sadducees were depending for their eternal security on their physical descent from Abraham. John knew that, so he said to them in verse 8, Do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham for our father. And that's, that was what they were thinking. We have Abraham for our father. But John knew that mere physical descent 
did not guarantee their being a true son of Abraham, but rather that God was able to raise up children to Abraham entirely apart from such ethnic advantage. In fact, and John must have looked around on the ground of the rocky soil, this uh, rocky landscape. In fact, from these lifeless stones, he said, God is able to raise up children to Abraham. Now, you know, Jesus uh, would later use the same figure. I can raise them up from these uh, stones. And Paul, later still, would write about who the true Jew was. That's Romans chapter 2, a fascinating uh, chapter. But this misunderstanding has application uh, well beyond the ancient times, well beyond all those people 2,000 years ago. I, I called it a delusion that has crippled sinners for all time. Every generation is prone to the dangerous propensity to believe they have merit with God because of another's piety, a religious profession. And the most direct application for most of us is that one would believe he or she or she is a Christian uh, because of their parents' faith or because they grew up in the church or, or perhaps they still come to church services faithfully. But it's the only true believing faith in Jesus Christ that saves. It is individual and not related in any way to deeds we perform or our associations with other people. And John was charging these pretending faithful of Israel to provide evidence of their faith and repentance by bearing fruits in keeping with repentance. That's the phrase, bearing fruits in keeping with repentance. And that figure is of a fruit tree, but a barren fruit tree. Now, Jesus would use a similar figure in the Sermon on the Mount. It wasn't that long ago we read and studied the Sermon on the Mount, but in Matthew 7, 16, Jesus said, you will know them by their fruits. Every good tree bears good fruit, but the evil tree bears evil fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire, so then you will know them by their, their fruits. Well, John is using a, a like figure in verse 9. Indeed, the axe is already laid at the root of the trees, so every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So what we have here is the sad certainty, the reality of God's judgment. God has a divine hostility to all evil. And this vivid and chilling figure ought to bring fear and trembling, trembling to all who are uncertain of the reality of their faith. And you know how careful we are uh, from our lecterns not to instill a fear in those who just have some doubts about their salvation. But here is a warning to all who uh, merely profess their faith, who have an empty guise of belief in Jesus Christ. It is impossible to fool God. It is useless and it's insulting to his character to try. And John knew that. Therefore, he did not mince words. He was a prophet, but he was also a bold and true preacher of the Word of God. His mission was God's mission. He had no other agenda. He was not after fame, or he wouldn't have said these things, not after high regard or the admiration of his peers. He had an assignment from the king and would not stop until he had carried it out. The only approval he sought was the Lord's. John was the very picture of great courage, great conviction, 
And God used him that way, used him in a mighty way. William Lane, who wrote one of the very best commentaries on the Gospel of Mark, observed that when John appeared in the wilderness, it was an eschatological event of the first magnitude, and it signified that the decisive turning point in the history of salvation was at hand. He was the forerunner to the Messiah, the herald of the King of Kings. And he called the people of his day to the repentance and faith that would forestall judgment. Well, Luke concludes this section of the gospel with the response of the people on this occasion. His teaching was rejected out of hand, it seems, by those Jewish leaders he had condemned, uh, but others remain to ask questions. He divides them into three groups, you see. First, the crowds generally, then the tax collectors, finally some soldiers. But the question noticed from each was the same. What shall we do? What shall we do? And significantly, since John's advice to all three eventually concerns how we handle material possessions, we're to understand that a, a good indicator of the spiritual fruit that we are producing out of our faith and repentance is how we show love to others in our attitude to gaining possessions and money, holding on to them, and giving them away. Here is our fruit. First, if you have more, share with those who have less. If you have two tunics, share with him who has zero tunics. We don't have to think about tunics and how the people of John's day dressed in order to understand this. We could spend time talking about that. But if you have material wealth, share with those who are struggling. The second group was the tax collectors. We know about them. Uh, the Romans conscripted them to collect the t Roman tax from their fellow Jews, and they had this reputation that was rampant, you see it in the New Testament, for extracting far more than was necessary for the purpose of making themselves wealthy. John told them to repent of that and stop stealing from others. And the third was the soldiers, the word used for them, identifying them most likely as auxiliary police types in the employ of the Jewish authorities. They may even have been there to protect the tax collectors, but John's direction was to stop extorting money from the defenseless and instead be content with your wages. To the degree that these three group groups heeded John's direction, then it could be said of them that they were now bearing fruits, there's the phrase, fruits in keeping with repentance. So we need to close, and, and, and I want to close with this. In Acts 13, I keep referring uh, to Luke's other book, Acts, but in the 13th chapter of Acts, uh, he records the Apostle Paul's sermon in the synagogue at Pisidian Antioch. And in it, as he often did, you'll remember that little sermon. He reviewed Israel's history. He would frequently uh, do that. And as he came to David there in his sermon, he went immediately, to, he fast-forwarded to Jesus, the, the greater son of David, in verse 23 of Acts 13. From the descendants of this man, meaning David, according to promise, God has brought to Israel a Savior, Jesus. After John had proclaimed before his coming, a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. God sent John to minister to the people before Christ undertook his own ministry and ultimate sacrifice. Our passage has provided us with John's mission. I want to point it out to you as we close in verse 4 and verse 8. It was verse 4 to make ready a people for the coming of the Lord. In verse 8, it was to urge them to repentance and to faith. As a, as a nation they had largely abandoned both. They were living as sinners 
with judgment certain to come. But the most wonderful thing lay behind John's message. And we see it in verses 3 and 6. Forgiveness and the salvation of God. God brought to Israel a Savior, is what Paul said after John's ministry was fulfilled. The salvation of God, of verse 6, that all flesh will see, is in the person of Jesus Christ. In him, Paul wrote in another place, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. So forgiveness, what a wonderful word. Uh, what a wonderful concept. What a wonderful reality for you and for me. I've forgotten now who reported this to me, but they had seen an unmarked tombstone outside of a town in New York with only word, one word on it, three syllables, forgiven. I'll take that for my tombstone right now. The Polish mathematician Copernicus uh, revolutionized mankind's thinking about the universe. He had a famous treatise called The Revolution of the Heavenly Bodies. It was printed, history tells us, just in time uh, to lay it in his arms as he lay dying in his bed in 1543. Yet this man who had accomplished so much uh, before God saw himself not as this great astronomer and scholar, but as a sinner. And today on his grave at Frauenburg, or Fromborg, you can read the epitaph which he chose for himself. I do not seek a kindness equal to that given to Paul, nor do I ask the grace granted to Peter but the forgiveness which thou didst give to the robber, that I earnestly pray. John came preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. It was to be gained by Christ, and that is John's greatness. He prepared the way for a great Savior to all of us by God's grace, serve today. Let's give thanks to him. Father, we do thank you that we have a great Savior. I thank you for the ministry of this man, uh, John the Baptist, who prepared the way. Uh, he smoothed the roads, and uh, he prepared hearts uh, to meet their king. And you, by your spirit, worked in those hearts uh, to to give them the gift of repentance and faith. Thank you that you have done that in these people in this room today. I'm grateful myself uh, for that gift. Thank you for a Savior who saves. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.